Hello, welcome to the Future of Dermatology podcast. The following lecture was given by Dr. Serena L. Myra at our November 18th SF Derm conference. It was a wonderful talk, and I'm really excited to share it here on our podcast series as well, so we can make it available to all of our listeners and all of our members. She speaks on bearing the burden of pregonodularis relief and resolution with new and emerging therapies. And this uh, talk was sponsored by an educational grant from Integrity Continuing um, Education. So I, I hope everybody enjoys this as I did at our conference. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Pregonodularis, I think, is probably not a stranger to anybody on this call. Uh, it is a very um, probably underdiagnosed condition. We'll talk about that, but something that really, I think, has a tremendous impact on the quality of life of our patients. And there are new and emerging options for its management. So I'm happy to talk about that today. And I just want to point out that this has been, this um, activity is provided by um, Integrity Continuing Medical Education, and it was supported by a grant from Sir Sanofi Regenera. That's me. Hello. Here are my disclosures. Let me go back to whatever that was. Okay. So today's learning objectives, we're going to talk about how to really characterize the burden of disease in PN. And, um, you know, we'll touch on the the itch and the quality of life and the stress that I just mentioned. We'll talk a bit about this evolving idea of the pathophysiology of PN. And we're going to start to discuss what evidence is out there for current management, uh, as well as the new and emerging therapies that are available. becoming available. Start coming. Okay. Um, so let's start to talk about the disease burden and who really gets this disease and how are they affected when they have it. Now, based on earlier data, the estimated prevalence of pregonodularis is about eighty. Well, actually, this is the incidence is about eighty three thousand um, patients, and they're about one hundred and forty eight per one hundred thousand of the population. It is those numbers are starting to grow. Even just last year, um, the numbers were creeping upwards of 80, closer to 90. I think as more patients are presenting, we're going to start to see uh, a subtle shift in those numbers. We know that women are slightly more likely to be affected than men. Um, there are more women who will present for this based on claims data. We also know that this is a condition that is much more likely to affect African Americans compared and 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 black patients compared to our white counterparts, our Asian or Latino uh, populations. And even the disease, while it's a very, very similar process, there are kind of specific or distinct disease biomarkers in certain subsets or populations. Now, it, classically, parigonodularis is something that develops kind of middle age and beyond. We start to see a, an increase in the 40 to 50 bracket and then uh, upwards to about the seven beings. It can present at any time. I have seen kids with this. I've also seen elderly patients in their 80s or 90s who've had lingering itch and then really develop what looks more like parigonodularis a little bit later. But that peak bracket is about 40 to, to 70. <clears throat> And our understanding of, of pregonodularis has really evolved over the last few years. The most you know, critical symptom, the one the patients complain about the most, and usually the first that presents, is itch. It, it's an intense itch. It's a relentless itch. Those are you know very, very good words to characterize this disease. It's It really, for the average atopic derm, even a moderate severe atopic dermatitis patient, which we you know, know and really digest as an itchy disease, even those itchy psoriasis patients, usually pregonodularis as patients rate it kind of is much, much higher in the severity. The issue with pruritus in this group, however, is... Um, is is that it leads to this vicious itch scratch cycle. And when we're just talking about the skin and the pathophysiology, I think many of us can appreciate that. There's a scratch. We'll go into this a little bit more. That leads to uh, you know kind of evolving factors and inflammatory um, component, a fibrotic component that continues that itch scratch cycle at the nodule uh, and somewhat at the surrounding skin, even though this we're realizing more this is a bit more of a systemic disease than we once thought. However, the impact of the itch scratch cycle, as this slide suggests, is much, much greater. So these patients, 
just from the itch alone, even if they weren't scratching, they have, which they are obviously, but they have a dramatic sleep debt that develops quite quickly, actually, in the condition because they're itchy all the time. These patients wake up in the middle of the night from just intolerable itch. They cannot go back to sleep. It starts to destabilize them. They end up having more psychosocial struggles, not just because they're covered in these bumps that they usually don't understand, right? They don't have the rash that precedes it. So they are often told by other physicians that this is something they're doing to themselves that actually does still happen today, um, that it's a psychiatric disease. There are many things that these patients are told or they're told nothing, right? So they they essentially develop these additional struggles, embarrassment. They start to like withdraw from society. And, you know, this is even in moderate cases. Like patients don't have to be extreme to start doing this. They pull back from their activities. They change the clothing they're wearing. Um, and all of that really leads to worsening depression and anxiety. And, you know, then these patients present and they've got this, this anxious state as they're presenting to you with this clear dermatologic condition. But they they often, even within dermatology, are not kind of supported from the mental health aspects of this disease. And they're told their anxiety is just fueling it, which it, certainly it might be. But that is not... Um, really the message we're trying to get across, right? It's part of the disease. So that itch scratch cycle has a really broad, broad impact on what these patients are going through. And I think really if there's anything you take from it, this from this talk, that's the most important thing to remember because now there are also things we can do about it. We don't want to delay our treatment. So, and I'll get into that later. But so as I mentioned to you, when when patients with prigonodularis have been surveyed across, really in the U.S., but here's a study highlighting um, from 12 European countries that was performed partly by the International Forum for the Society of Itch and their group, their members. Um, itch was by far the predominant symptom that was most bothersome to patients. Now, patients didn't like the visibility of their lesions, the bleeding, their sleep debt, all of that. But the thing that they really just you know, identified most with as the most bothersome part was itch. Now, we also know, as I mentioned, that itch is what um, disrupts sleep very often. Sixty-one uh, percent of patients in a separate study actually said that their sleep disturbance rated their sleep disturbance by itch as great, meaning it had a huge impact on them, and it was really the number one cause. It's very, very few patients, as you see. You know, less than 25, essentially, that don't have um, that don't say that their itch was severe enough to disrupt their sleep. So it's the majority of these patients. And when we think about this population, we also know that this group uh, has a really high kind of metabolic dysfunction load. So when you compare parigonodularis patients to patients, um, and you'll see that here on this graph that's looking at the proportion of patients that are affected on the left and then the different disease states and metabolic diseases, cardiovascular and other comorbidities, um, you can see that the, those, that dark blue bar of patients with parigonodularis um, really is much higher in each one of those groups than the patients that we see that are either control patients that um, are kind of general patients who are coming in, atopic dermatitis, or even psoriasis, where we associate it often with metabolic and cardiovascular disease, right? So so these patients have a much higher likelihood or much higher odds um, than non-parigo patients of having chronic kidney disease, diabetes, um, you know, strokes, heart attacks, HIV, various things. And we we also know, as I mentioned, that the majority of these patients, the numbers are probably higher than even is shown in this one retrospective study, um, but the number of patients with PN who have depression, anxiety, or at least one other psychiatric disorder is really, really high. Most of them have anxiety, and when they have uh, have been identified as having some type of um, psychiatric condition, it's typically going to be um, an overlap of anxiety and depression. Uh, but again, really high burden in these patients. You know, again, this question of what comes first, chicken or the egg, you know, there might be susceptibilities that allow someone to to develop this. But you take anybody who's not sleeping most nights, right? And they're going to develop some aspect frequently, of I, particularly anxiety and I think some depression and withdrawal. So we still don't really know that. And I can just tell you in managing a lot of these people, as patients get better, 
lot of that starts to melt away when they re they incorporate themselves back into their lives. So, you know, patients with PN rate the quality, their overall health utility, right? So we're looking at health utility scores here, a health index questionnaire that was given out to patients with PN, and it was compared to patients with other who've used this same scoring tool for many, many other conditions that you see here on the bottom, you know, patients on dialysis, asthma, diabetes, cutaneous lymphoma, stroke, um, all of these, Parkinson's, all the ones listed. And if you look at that red bar, that's how patients um, rate their prigonodularis. This means, you know, on this scale, this is how poor their quality of life is. They kind of veer towards that right side. It means only patients with emphysema, untreated, um, and actually I should say this is severe to moderate, um, moderate to severe osteoarthritis and Parkinson's rate the quality of their life worse than PN patients. When you look at patients who've had strokes, diabetes, asthma, hypertension, dialysis, they have a higher quality of life overall than PN patients. So please, you know, we should not be ignoring that. So now let's start to talk about diagnosis and how we think about PRIGO. You know, the first thing is to recognize that, that you know, the kind of the key features of PRIGO nodularis is that it has to be chronically itchy, right, over six weeks, which most of these patients are. They need to have some type of nodular lesion. But I, here we're going to touch on the importance of the fact that there really are different morphologies um, if you look at the Europeans, they they actually use an umbrella term different from parigo nodularis. They call it chronic parigo, and then they break it up into different subsets. They do that so that people don't miss other man morphologic manifestations of PN. So while our, in the U.S., we really focus on this nodular lesion, right, and then evidence of other scratching, that's, those are kind of the three criteria for it, it is important to know that people can have localized disease, they can have ex extensive disease. You know, the extremities and the upper trunk are really kind of the big areas, um, but it can happen on the scalp, it can happen most places, it's less likely on the face or the genitals, but it is... Um, they can the lesions themselves can have different morphologies and they can look different in lighter skin um, where they look maybe like more pink or slightly hyperpigmented or erythematous and in darker skin where they'll look more hyperpigmented violaceous at times um, and then can have that kind of white you know area of scar or excoriation but important to know that it can have different morphologies whether it's umbilicated ulcerated all that so this is um, just, uh, again, uh, commenting here on the distribution. As I mentioned, the back and the extremities, so the fronts and backs of the arms, but also just the back, the buttocks, those are kind of the most commonly affected areas. The palms, the 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 backs of the feet, the soles, and the, the head are less likely to be involved. And often you'll see, you know, we're familiar kind of with this butterfly sign where there's sparing of the nodules in the areas where patients cannot scratch. And if you really ask patients, it doesn't mean that they're not itchy there. It's that they can't really get there as easily. But in severe patients, they'll find a way. And, you know, there are many conditions that can be confused with prigonodularis. There, you know, even once you're looking just at the lesion, there can be hypertrophic lichen planus, keratoacanthomas, perforating disorders, um, you know, even bullous pemphigoid, scabies, things that may or may not have a really... Um, you know, when they're kind of in the pre urticarial stage and you just see more of the scratch lesions, sometimes that can be misdiagnosed and it's really PN. Uh, I think very often people are diagnosed with more psychiatric disorders, like neurogenic, I'm sorry, um, they'll, the, with uh, neurotic excoriations um, or excoriation disorder, as we like to, to refer to it now. So those are possible, um, you know, those are, those are very often the diagnoses that people will come into me with or referred to. Uh, for that. Now, there are obviously very differences between kind of the the more common atopic dermatitis, although there's an overlap there. Some patients with AD do develop prigonodularis. You do not have to have atopic dermatitis to have prigonodularis, nor do you have to have atopic dermatitis to benefit from some of the same treatments um, for prigonodularis that would also benefit an AD patient, and we'll get into that in a minute. Psoriasis tends to have a much more, you know, I think as we're all familiar, kind of classic erythematous scaly plaque. Uh, but um, PN, you really start to see those distinct lesions, whether they're nodules or ulcerated um, kind of lesions and even papules. And you can have multiple morphologies, by the way, all at one time. 
So I think we already touched on some of the diagnostic criteria. Here is a sample from the um, European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology, where they, again, highlight chronic itch over six weeks, this history um, or signs of repeated scratching or manipulation. It can be localized or generalized. And you see here, they upfront talk about these different morphologies, plaques, nodules, umbilicated. They don't have ulcerated here, but that's another really common type. Um, and, and the other thing I'll hi highlight is that you know, paritis or itch really should be present as kind of the initial sign. It's real. I mean, patients will describe burning and pain and other things, but itch has to be critical to it. So um, other aspects of their criteria, again, this idea that I, I just want to highlight that the lesions can start localized and then really spread, but most patients will feel itch in other areas, even if you don't see lesions. So sometimes it's good to get that you know, just that that ask that question, are you itchy and where are you itchy, even if it's in areas that they don't have signs um, or actual clinical features yet of, of lesions. Now, when we think through the diagnostic algorithm for these patients, there have actually been a couple of different algorithms that have been put out there for chronic itching. It's, it's a bit similar for parigonodularis, things that we do because in that first year of onset of parigo, there are, um, and this is true even just of itch, uh, that there's a higher risk of there being some detectable trigger to their disease. So if you see somebody who really had acute onset itch and nodules within the last year, those are the patients where you might want to be thinking, gosh, am I missing you know, an autoimmune disease or a cancer or something that's really erupting? Otherwise, for all patients, we do this routine screen that we, again, that we're so familiar with with itching. We look at their complete blood counts, their metabolic profile, hemoglobin A1C, just to see if they could be diabetic or pre-diabetic. Um, you know, HIV, hepatitis C, as directed, you know, by your review of systems or concerns. And you're trying to rule out a lot of metabolic diseases, as you see there on the left side. When it's indicated, either based on the history, the physical, you know, um, we will sometimes, if you're not sure that it's, uh, you know, that it could actually be hypertrophic lichen planus or a, an isolated KA, you know, things like that, you might want to, or in the setting actually more of eruptive KAs, you might want to do a biopsy or a DIF. But I want to be clear that that's not required for this diagnosis. It is actually a clinical diagnosis. And then um, additional studies where you're, again, ruling in or out infection, um, hematologic malignancies, uh, you know, iron or really other kind of metabolic or vitamin deficiencies, B12 being another one, um, imaging studies. Those are really, again, based more on your review of systems and just your general um, concern for the patient based on their overall presentation, less, you know, less just the presence of parigonodularis. So I think I went over much of this. This is similar to um, what has been recommended by the EADB. This was um, put together with a, uh, a I, I worked on it with a group of, um, you know, expert kind of PN experts, if you will, people who see a lot of itch. Tim Berger was on this with me um, and we put together kind of our recommendations. We already just went through that. And I want to talk about severity assessment. I think most of us just go into a room and we kind of give a gestalt assessment, like they're almost clear, they're mild, they're moderate. There are actually definitions for that based on the European literature. For example, you know, a, moder a mild patient would have 20 or less or 19 or less nodules, whereas a, a moderate patient would have 20 to 100, right? I mean, I think most of us, when we start to see 70, 80, 100, we start to think they're severe, but there are patients who are even 100 to 200 or beyond. So um, keeping that, you know, in mind, it is actually important, I think, to, you know, not count every nodule, but potentially get a sense of the different areas of localization as well as the overall nodular burden. And then the other thing, actually, that's not mentioned here that is, I think, critical for a lot of these disorders going forward, um, and whether we like it, insurance may put this on us or not just for approval and monitoring, but it, it does help when you're also working with the patient is get like an itch score, right? Like just say, how itchy are you? Even if you have your MA or somebody else as they're putting in the room, putting the patient in the room, just like you have people rate pain, just just say, how bad is your itch over the last few days or last week or today? Um, and having that on a numeric rating scale or a visual analog scale can be really helpful as you're following these patients over time. Okay, so let's briefly just take a moment. Let's talk about out a case. Um, this is a 42-year-old woman, Crystal, who has been experiencing severe itch, noticed dome-shaped papules for about 18 months, 
She really doesn't know her diagnosis. She feels like she can't engage in her life anymore. She's anxious. She doesn't want people to see her. She doesn't know if she's going to transmit this disease. Somewhere in this last year, she was also diagnosed with diabetes, and she's really been experiencing insomnia, whether because she's itchy or anxious. And so, you know, when we think about a patient like Crystal, we're wondering, you know, what do we do for her? How do we make this diagnosis? This is somebody that, you know, you might do that initial battery of tests. We already know she has diabetes. That may be a risk factor for her, but that doesn't mean we're not going to look into other, you know, things. So we're going to check a CBC, that kind of initial screening panel. If she gives us a sense that she's been coughing or losing weight or having other issues, you know, maybe we are, you know, at that point, we're going to to think about a, um, you know, a chest X-ray. But but really, I think the, the goal for Crystal is starting to, after we do her physical exam, really incorporate this into a picture of PN and start to explain it um, to her. And then we'll start to talk about, you know, the treatment. So we'll come back to, to Crystal in a moment. Um, but I also think the last thing is acknowledging her quality of life and 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 recognizing that she's not sleeping. That's something that we can also start to address. So let's let's turn now. Let's talk about pathogenesis uh, of the disease. We're you know I I'm still shocked. Even just a week and a half ago, I was I was at a dinner um, to you know essentially discussing kind of evolving topics in in dermatology. And I I was amazed by how many people still felt pretty certain that pyrigonodularis was a psychiatric disease. And this is amongst dermatologists. I, I really was a bit surprised by the, it was all almost 50 percent of the room. Um, and so that tells me we need to 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 acknowledge some of the new things that we know. Right. So uh, pyrigonodularis, we believe, is really a reflection of dysregulation between the, I'm going to put neural up front here, the, the neuroimmune um, system, if you will. So we know that these patients have an increase in type 2 cytokines, um, IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, and their um, primary dysregulation, we believe, actually happens because of this underlying uh, dysregulation of the nerve. There's some nerve injury or irritation that leads to the release of neuropeptides that then starts this elaborate type 2 dysregulation. Um, and and that crosstalk is what actually also leads to the sensitization of nerves. Um, and that is what we believe underlies this itch scratch cycle. Okay, so this pathology that there are aspects of this disease that can manifest not only in the skin and the peripheral nerves, but even in the spinal cord and in the brain. So um, these patients really are hard hardwired a bit differently. And we know here that there are multiple aspects of this disease that we still don't have a handle on. But essentially, you know, when we think about kind of itch, pathways. We know that we've got these um, C fibers and A delta fibers that are in the skin they, and right below the, the so they're reaching up into the, the stratum granulosum of the epidermis. They're also hanging out there right at the DEJ and then throughout the dermis. Uh, they have their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. They synapse into the spinal cord um, onto second order neurons that then transverse up the spinal thalamic tract up to the higher orders of the brain, where you're sensing, um, you're, you're not only sensing, but you're kind of, you're, you're coordinating the various aspects of itch scratch, right? And um, for itch in general, we know now that just like pain, there are sensitization pathways. At any point in the skin, the spinal cord, or the brain, you can sensitize the itch neurons or the itch pathway. And in the, the periphery, Various inflammatory, um, you know, cytokines, if you will, can can and other molecules can play a role in that. Whether it's causing nerve proliferation or just more like an increased sensitization or sensitivity to other peritogens that happens in the periphery, and that is something we believe in pyrigonodularis happens with this itch scratch cycle, the disruption of the um, epithelial barrier as well as the fibroblasts, you know. Uh, um, I have some colleagues uh, who often say, I think Brian Kim often says, I can make somebody scratch, right? And I can, I, you know, if they feel itch, but not everybody who scratches is going to get pyrigonodularis. And so we know that there is some dysregulation even in the fibroblasts in this condition uh, that are leading again to and feeding into the what we believe is this whole type 2 dysregulation. 
So this is a pretty busy slide, but what I want to do here is just touch on this topic of the fact that we, you know, there's some underlying itch. And so you see this tiny little kind of, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, you see this tiny little unmyelinated C fiber, that's your perceptor, your itch nerve. Um, something is dysfunctional here, okay, for whatever whatever that is. It, this nerve may be sensing itch. There may be some other low level of activity signaling coming from the epidermis or even in the dermis, the immune cells, but this nerve is activated. And what happens is as, as these patients scratch, they disrupt the epidermal barrier as we would expect. This leads to the release of additional alarmins, TSLP, IL-33, that can bind and activate, sensitize, and induce itch, okay? So it's going to bind to these nerves and activate them. We also know that this leads to the elaboration and the differentiation of TH2 cells that then go on to produce type 2 cytokines, IL-4, IL-13. This leads to the, you know, other innate adaptive innate and adaptive immune cells to elaborate production of IL-31, um, which we'll hear a little bit more about, as well as engage kind of the the other components of this, B cells, the fibroblasts, fibroblasts, um, you know, um, release periostin, and that as, as actually do, I think, keratinocytes, but that can activate all of these nerves and leads to that sensitization. So as you see here, you see all these different cytokines and various molecules, they all have receptors on the nerve. Right. And so some of the newer agents that we're going to talk about actually block that. And this is that type two dysregulation that involves the Im immune system and the nerve that really plays an important role in periconodularis. So we know some of this now in part because of our our use of medications um, to, to to work backwards. Right. And figure out, wow, we thought this was a psychiatric disease or even maybe a neuropathic disease. And now we can use a drug like dupilumab that's been used in atopic dermatitis. And we realize it's helping these patients. So let me tell you about that. But that is what's leading to this evolution in our thought about prigonodularis. Fair, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Am I OK on time? Yeah, no, you're perfect because we even started a little bit early. So okay, perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. So I joined a little bit later. Just wanted to just make note that we are recording this. So if you missed like the first few slides, you can always catch up later. You do. Thank you guys for for being here for those who just had a moment to join. So so you know, dupilumab has obviously been around and was approved for atopic dermatitis and other you know um, atopic and allergic diseases. However. In September of 2022, it was approved for adults with prigonodularis. And this is something, as we're familiar, it is an IL-4 receptor alpha blocker. So um, it blocks the effects of IL-4 and IL-13 cytokines. We know that it does that, you know, on the target immune cells, but it does it on the nerve. So I'm going to just take a second and go back to that. Your nerves express IL-4 and IL-13, as well as other type 2 cytokine um, you know, a, and other alarmin receptors, uh, many others. And so one of the primary reasons dupilumab may be working is because it has these pleiotropic effects. It's affecting multiple cell types. And I'm going to touch on that when we get back to like the traditional therapies for that. But as of now, dupilumab is the only FDA-approved treatment for prigonodularis, and it was approved based on the pivotal phase three trials, the Liber Liberty PN Prime and Prime Two clinical trials, Patients had to have PN with moderate to severe disease, so at least over, the, that's where I was telling you that IGA score, kind of over 20 nodules. They also had to have severe itch. So their worst itch numerical rating score had to be a seven or above. So that's pretty high, okay? Um, the Liberty Prime had about 151 patients. The Liberty Prime 2 had 160 uh, PN patients. The uh, the primary endpoint, one of the primary endpoints in this trial was to look at a four point reduction, four point or over reduction in their worst itch NRS score compared to baseline. Um, in the prime trials, that was evaluated at week 24. And then the prime two, that was evaluated at week 12. So just be aware that the timing of that endpoint was different. They also looked at the investigator global assessment, um, you know, scale actually doing nodule counts. So they did actual counts in this data and um, in, in these trials. And what we can see from these trials is that the uh, the the baseline itch, you know, these patients were very, very well matched in terms of their itch, their pain, their sleep debt, um, very, very, very high um, burden here. 
And when we now look at their results in, again, in prime, the primary endpoint was at week 24. So I'm just going to highlight here on the left side, 60% of patients were able to reach a four point or more reduction in their worst itch scale compared to baseline. Um, so tw week 24 compared to baseline. That when you think about this population of treating these people, I mean, that's a really impressive amount, um, I think. And, I, you know, to some people, this may not seem amazing. But think about how many drugs you've had to throw at these patients, put them on thalidomide, things like that in the past. And you're getting 60 percent of patients get a four point reduction. So I think that's great compared to 18 percent of placebo. Um the, you know, even at week 12, it was about 44% of patients that had had that same degree of improvement in prime. Then in prime two, we see very similar numbers. The primary endpoint here, though, was at week 12. So that was just around four, like 37%. Um, and at week 24, uh, it, it was about, you know, 57, 58%. So this is dupilumab achieving that improvement in the four-point reduction. And, and although it's not shown here, there's a very similar pattern with the um, clearance. Now, we always say when you look at these trials, and as you're evaluating trials even going forward, because there are going to be more and more coming out, um, they, they usually will look at itch, because we all know that that's the most kind of important symptom to patients that also is involved in this disease. But but really even nodular counts and nodules tend to trail the the improvement in itch. So the but even the nodular count really was a pretty impressive improvement along the same um, the same order of magnitude, which is great. So uh, the you know we're all familiar with dupixin for other, and dupilumab for other um, you know reasons for atopic dermatitis. The safety profile actually held up very very well in the prime and prime two trials. There were really no additional safety signals. Um, in the the Dupi group uh, for um, for this, and and actually, in kind of in real world experience, and even in the trials, there was lots of when we find you know the additional conjunctivitis that people get, the, the some of that like worsening of the head and neck eczema. They actually don't see that as much in in P, the PN population in this PN trial, and I think that's borne out in real world use. Now, there's another agent that a lot of people are thinking about, asking about, and that's nemalizumab. Um, that is uh, this emerging agent. It is not yet approved. Uh, the the phase three, the pivotal trials, the phase three trials, the Olympia one and two trials are just have just read out. Olympia two, I believe, has been published now. Olympia one has been announced. It was, um, you know, initially introduced. Uh, I think they they had the results at um, top one results at the EADV um, just a, you know two months ago, and also they spoke about it at the World Congress of Itch. So nemalizumab is this emerging. Um, IL-31 receptor alpha inhibitor blocker, so it's a monoclonal antibody, and it is a um, subcutaneous injection that is, you know, has been delivered every four weeks. In the Olympia-2 trial shown here, there's a loading dose based on your weight, and then you're just maintained... Um, I'm sorry. There's a loading dose, and then your your continuing dose depends on your um, on your weight. Uh, the uh, the criteria for enrollment in these trials was essentially the same. Patients had to have chronic pyrigo. They had to have over 20 nodules. They had to have um, a worst itch over over seven. So the the enrollment criteria were were relatively similar um, to the the prime trials for dupilumab. The primary endpoints here, so things to note, four-point improvement in the peak paritis, so PPNRS, a little different than the worst itch, but they're essentially the same thing. Um, and that's compared to baseline. Here, the readout was at week 16, so keep that in mind. And uh, the other primary endpoint was the proportion of patients that had a clear or almost clear, uh, as well as a two-point reduction from baseline in their IG score. So um, just a tiny bit different. You can't compare the two trials directly. But in the Olympia 2 trial, they found that nemalizumab shown here in blue, um, that the proportion of patients that achieved a four-point improvement or more on their PPNRS was about 56% at week 16, compared to about 20 percent in placebo and their IgA response. So these are clear to almost clear. Remember, these patients had to have at least 20 nodules on average. They had actually had much, much more. Um, that 
almost 40% of patients had were able to achieve clear or almost clear by week 16. So that's the nodule count um, compared to 11% of placebo. So this is with um, the with nemolizumab. And when you actually look at kind of the kinetics or the timing of this, even by week four, so very, very early on, that means one dose of nemolizumab, 41% of patients actually had at least a four-point improvement in their drop. And that continued to climb throughout the week 16 till that 56% compared to the placebo line in gray. And you can see the same thing um, with the IgA response. So again, that trails a little bit, but even by week four, 10% of patients had um, clear to almost clear of their um, nodular counts. Now, in terms of, uh, of safety and the Olympia 2 trials, they overall, it was very, very safe. You know, um, well, a slight majority of patients actually did have um, adverse, um, some kind of reported adverse events. The most common were were kind of just headache and GI. Those were common in both placebo um, and the NEMO group. There was a small increase in the amount of um, the number of patients who had either kind of new onset or exacerbation of their atopic dermatitis. So that is something to, um, you know, to to kind of be aware of. These were, as from what we understand, potentially more, you know, mild cases, but they were, um, but they were considered kind of either new onset or exacerbation of AD. Now, the phase three Olympia one um, trial, so this was a very similarly designed trial, and Nemolizumab is monotherapy, the same primary endpoints, also looking at week 16. And this essentially confirmed what we saw in Olympia 2, that about 58% of patients um, on Nemo were able to achieve that improvement in their peak itch NRS um, the, with over a four-point improvement um, compared to about 16% in the placebo group. And then 26% were able to reach zero or clear on an IgA compared to the 7.3 uh, at that early at that early time point. So um, very very similar results there. And then you know just to to kind of let you know that this field is evolving. You know kind of beyond these two big juggernauts that everybody's thinking about, right? Dupilumab and nemolizumab. Um, there are there's a real interest in this area. So there are other phase two and three trials going on, actually some phase ones that are going to be started. So we'll see how those bear out too. But there's nalbifene, which is an opioid agonist, kappa agonist, mu antagonist in the PRISM trials. Uh, that is an oral agent. And um, that study has been completed. A, uh, you know, we will be seeing, I think, a little bit more about uh, that as time goes on. Nemolizumab, as we mentioned, um, there are actually several phases of trials still going on beyond just um, the Olympia 1 and 2 that I told you about. And then Vexarelumab, which is the uh, which is kind of anta it's antagonizing the IL-31 pathway as well. Um, but it is a drug that actually targets the oncostatin M receptor um, beta subunit, which is part of what binds to, it's the heterodimer that forms with the IL-31 receptor. So uh, the idea here is that you're still antagonizing that system, and that um, has finished its phase two uh, as well. So when we're thinking about a treatment and we're thinking about the current guidelines, both from the International Forum for the Study of Itch and from the the kind of U.S. consensus that's been done on these, uh, you know, they're a little bit outdated. The goals, however, remain the same. The top three goals when you ask patients, um, so when both, I told you there have been studies in Europe, there have been studies in the U.S., and when we ask patients what they care about, the, their, their top priority um, of the thing that really needs to be addressed is the itch. Their second priority is that they want improvement in the lesions and they want improvement in their sleep. And so it depends on what study you look at, but essentially those are the top three. You know, control the itch, heal the lesions, improve my quality of life and my sleep. When um, a panel of us uh, kind of U.S. itch, uh, I call them, I call us itchy files, you know, <laughs> we're, we're interested in, in itching and people who manage a lot of PN patients, uh, we came together, as I mentioned, and put together just kind of a consensus guideline on how you manage these patients. I want to point out this is before Dupelumab was approved. 
Um, and really, even before some of these other drugs, they were just starting to, to begin their phase three trials when this was all put together. So we looked at the literature. We looked at what was out there, our own current practices and managing, you know, having a high referral base for PN patients. And we put kind of a four-tiered system that integrated the fact that you needed to use or that most of us use some type of neural treatment as well as immune treatment. Um, and we, you know, tier one is where patients are mostly on topicals or intralesional therapies. Tier two, three, and four, systemic therapies. The most evidence in the literature was for tier two, cyclosporin, methotrexate, phototherapy on the immune side. The neural would be gabapentinoids, pregabalin and, um, and gabapentin, as well as antidepressants. Uh, at the time, there were evolving NK1 or tachykinin receptor inhibitors, uh, things like sirlopidin, aprepidin. You may have, um, be familiar with those. And then at the time, again, tier three and four were drugs that were either not well used, not well substantiated, or had higher toxicity. So the, the most important thing here is you could enter these tiers um, on either side at any point based on what your patient needed, and you should feel free in a way to pull from both sides. But really, most of the data that went into this table was not good. It was based on cohort studies, um, you know, case theories, and very, very few, if any, randomized control trials. So now, you know, similarly, the International Study, um, the International Forum for the Study of Itch, IFSI, had a very similar therapeutic ladder. Topicals then move on to a combination of a, you know, neuromod and an immune modulator uh, at the time. And both that was also, again, put together at a time where, where it was pre B. So, you know, I... Let's let's bring it to another patient. We'll talk for just a moment. And then I want to go back and make a comment about these existing therapies as well. So here we have a patient, Kenneth, 50-year-old gentleman, diagnosed uh, three months ago with prigonodularis, has moderate severity, so again, above 20 nodules, has tried topical steroids and gabapentin without relief. This is affecting his relationships. Um, the itch is kind of driving him crazy, you know, really unbearable, causing him embarrassment at work. And he can't even, he has to cover up his skin in the summer because he doesn't want people to see. So this is a patient where, you know, as we go back to, sorry, that list, he's been on, you know, kind of the first tier bottom right box. He's been on gabapentinoids. You know, what do you do in this patient? So Previously, this is the type of person where I would say you might need to ratchet up their gabapentinoids. You might need to actually add phototherapy, cyclosporin, acutely, or methotrexate. You know, now with the approval of dupilumab and hopefully with some of these, you know, others that are coming down the line, you'll be jumping to thinking about those instead. Uh, you know, again, you have to make that decision. We always tailor treatment to the individual patient. You know, depending on what dose of gabapentin he was on, I would consider actually increasing his gabapentin more or switching him to pregabalin. Um, but there are these individual options or individualized, you know, tailored treatment options that we have. These are these other options are not going away. It's simply that we need to be able to use them in addition to the tools that we now know we have really good data for. So with that, um, I am just going to, to summarize again. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Angelaris is a, a rare but very, very intense disease, has an extremely high burden of disease. It disproportionately affects African-Americans and women. We didn't even talk all that much about the distinctions in their disease uh, with this talk, but, um, you know, there we know that that's a problem. The All of the evolving Clinical trials, as well as basic and translational studies now, suggest that this is a disorder that is both neural and um, and immune in nature, with type two inflammation and dysregulation. Uh, we can we know again from clinical data antagonizing IL four, IL thirteen, and IL thirty one, just as I showed you, really decreases part of that burden in a large subset of these patients. So dupilumab is approved, emerging therapies, as we talked about, nemalizumab, and hopefully the others that also look at, you know, vexorelumab and nalbufine and, and others. So the the main goal is whatever you have to pull from, the goal is to control that itch and heal the lesions. 
as we learn more, I'll just say, as we learn more about the fibro, the, the kind of disproportionate dysregulation of fibrosis in different groups of patients with PN, that may also shift our thinking and how we treat going forward. But there's really lots to be done. Um, and I think a lot of hope for this field. I think we're actually, my opinion, we're kind of ahead of schedule with that. So I'm, I'm thrilled to end with that. And I know that there is a program evaluation as well as I think a post-test question that um, that you guys can answer. So with that, thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, these I, I, I find these talks are one of those things you, you, as you go through it, you start thinking about your patients from like five years ago or 10 years ago. And you're like, I think that person just had prigonodule. <laughs> I don't know yeah, if you know, no. that it's kind of shifting how we um, kind of just change how we kind of approach these patients because there's the, I feel like there's the classic patient you think of with just really the giant parigo nodules and it's like obvious, like that's a parigo nodule. But then I, I think that that slide you showed with the variation of how it can present is is kind of really, really, really interesting. So the, thank you so much for that one. You know, you know, it's really, it is, it is fascinating. And I, it's making me rethink some of the criteria, you know, when we put together kind of next guidelines, how we present this, you know, it's funny because the European groups have always been in favor of trying to push the, you know, their American, you know, counterparts us to changing the, literally changing the name to adopt more of a structure like they have. And we've always said, it doesn't matter. We just got an ICD, you know, you know, 10 code, let's not do it. There are reasons that would set us back. And it's funny how over time, as I've learned more about the disease myself, as I've spoken more about it, as I've seen patients who were not labeled as PN because they had different morphologies, but actually benefited you know, from, so, you know, they, they, you biopsy them and it comes back PN, right? Those are the cases where you might biopsy. It does come back B PN um, and they improve, right? With with either high dose, you know, gabapentinoids and methotrexate or dupixent and, and all these things. And you're just like, wow, I, I would have missed that if I did it just based on the nodular criteria. So I do think we need to open our minds about this. And even a seasoned dermatologist in this area, like we have a lot to learn about the clinical, like just the morphology, as you point out, are really important. No, that's fantastic. I think Martha has a question. Sure. I don't. Yes. Know. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, that was an excellent talk. And I was just wondering if you could comment on the overlap with parigonodularis and other, um, you know, chronic skin diseases. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. So parigonodularis can layer. We, you know, we most classically think of it with atopic dermatitis because a subset of AD patients will go on to, to, to have PN. You know, I think there's an evolving thinking in the field that, you know, even those patients with AD who develop PN are probably distinct in their AD compared to um, their you know, their other atopic counterparts. But you can see PN layered on to many other disorders. So, you know, somebody can actually start with a folliculitis, right? Like there there has to be some impetus. And usually in kind of the classic PN, as we're, you know, as we talk about it, it really does start with an itch. Um, you know, who knows if it's 50% of those, if not more, actually more of a neural itch because most of them don't recall a rash. But if you really talk to these patients, who again, have ultimately what looks like classic PN, um, sometimes it does start and it, you know with a folliculitis actually in the HIV population it can sometimes start more a little bit with a rash or what you thought was an eosinophilic folliculitis or infiltrate even in, in occasionally in BP patients um, you know they'll they'll start off with what looks like BP and um, or even the preurticarial BP then you put them in the BP category right the bolus pentacoid category but some of them will go on to develop PN. So I, I think PN is layered on top of these disorders, just as it can be layered on top of um, other metabolic diseases. Right? You know, not everybody with diabetes or neuropathic injury actually gets PN. So there's something about that type two dysregulation and actually the fibrosis, like the hyper um, kind of. I want to maybe we should call it sensitization of the fibroblasts that make them more proliferative and productive that essentially leads to PN. Because again, as those fibroblasts are proliferating, they're releasing periostin. As you've disrupted your epidermis, you might actually be releasing periostin. And we know that that can also increase um, nerve sensitization and stimulate it. And, you know, 
I, I keep talking about periostin, but that's just because it's one of the molecules we know about, right? What are the 300 others that are being released that we don't? It, it's all part of that same process. So, you know, what that genetic susceptibility is, um, you know, is it actually more kind of along the IL-22 or like a type 3 dysregulation also that's involved in some of these patients? Um, you know, we, we still don't know that. But you can see PN in the setting of other diseases. And I'm so glad you asked about that because the one other comment I would make is it doesn't mean whether it's an underlying metabolic systemic disorder, like let's say somebody does have HIV or diabetes um, or even a cancer, obviously you're going to treat those, right? You're going to manage those for what they are, but it doesn't mean you don't treat the PN because what we all believe for those of us who manage a lot of this and study it, you know, in the lab or in the clinic, um, is that PN is a disease entity in and of itself. So even if it's layered on another disease, it is a disease that needs to be treated in and of itself. And there are some people who are even going out there and, you know, I'm not sure the data yet support this, but they're at least evaluating whether you can actually worsen your metabolic disease, right, by not controlling your PN. But at the very, very least, you know, helping these people sleep, helping them regain their lives. Like you don't delay treatment of PN so that you can focus on the underlying, what you think might be the underlying predisposing factor. Because one, I don't know that the science is there yet. And two, your patients can't wait. They're miserable. Right. So, and so that's just an important point. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. I was kind of babbling yes. there. But it, yeah, it, no, it was I'm, excellent. But could I, if we have time, could I ask one more question? And that is, in, you know, in the slide, you talked about treatments and the different tiers, but that was pre-dupilumab. And where do you put dupilumab? Yeah. So we are working through this. Let me go back to it. Can you still see my screen? I think you can, right? That's still up. Yes. Okay. So, um, so right now where people are putting, I mean, I can't really speak for IFSI, even though I'm part of them. We're actually do we're re, we're working on the guidelines again right now, um, same thing for the U.S. consensus. We're essentially, you know, kind of inserting dupilumab in tier two. Uh, I am I'm speaking very freely on behalf of my colleagues through various conversations. So this is not an official recommendation, but I think most of us are in practice um, beginning to insert uh, dupilumab into tier two. And likely that will be the case, you know, pending kind of just the continued like safety profile of some of these other agents coming down the line. But, you know, that really does require more of a, I think, a a, a full consensus, um, you know, process. So that part is not official. But the other thing I want to I want to say is that I actually don't necessarily I mean, you know, 60 percent, we're getting 60 percent improvement at a lot of these patients, actually, which is amazing. I didn't show this data, but like 20 to 30 percent of these patients at those relatively early time windows are getting almost complete clearance, you know, where they're itch free, where they've done these like combined outcomes of itch free and um, nodule resolution. And it's it's really impressive. Um, but that being said, there's still a lot of patients out there who are still suffering. So one thing that I do is I may still keep them on their gabapentinoids or their, you know, amitriptyline or their doxepin or whatever, you know, their neuromodulator is while I'm tweaking some of their immune um, treatments, whether it's dupelumab, methotrexate, you know, uh, it, phototherapy. We use them all in conjunction because the one thing I didn't talk about here, but I think is really important, you know, and I'm not sure I could have said this 10 years ago, but I believe, you know, once you really get a patient controlled with this disease, even if it takes you a year or two to get there, you really can start to, like, you go into this remission or, like, quiescent phase where you've broken that itch scratch cycle, which is the most important thing, and then you might be able to get patients off of a lot of these drugs or at least the high doses. That, that may not be everybody, but that large group of patients that's not adequately responding right away still can benefit from some of these interventions you tailor it to the individual, but once you've gotten to the, to the point where they're really not developing new lesions and they're mostly clearing, there's something magic about a year, you know, a, at least at the very least a year, um, where that's when you can start to reevaluate how you do that. But just be tuned for upcoming guideline changes. I have actually a few questions, but any other questions before 
before I ask you a million questions. <laughs> no, it's like any other questions from anyone? Okay, that was it. We have a few minutes. I was just curious if I can pick your brain a little bit more about the fibroblast and the IL thirty one. There was the one photo of the, the all the mechanisms, um, the slide. I don't know if it's easy enough to get to it. Yeah, let me let me or just not. try to go back. Um, I can get back to it pretty quickly. It's, I mean, it's really fascinating it's to me. So fascinating. Like, since we have you here, I would love to just get your thoughts because it's when I think about the fibroblasts, we've kind of a lot of times, just, of course, wound healing and then anti aging with the fibroblast collapse, decreased collagen, and increased metalloproteinases when the fibroblast isn't working. So, those are like yeah. we're familiar with. And now it's sort of like, whole other thing fibroblasts are doing that we didn't know about yeah that, that i didn't know about i think it's it's new to me well you know you bring up well, an important point right because we we talk you know people get itchy as they age and forever we always thought it was just the fact that the epidermal barrier wasn't holding on to lipids and certainly that may play a role right but most people even when they when they moisturize if they've hit a certain severity of itch Moisturizing helps a little bit, but it doesn't help a lot. And so maybe some of that's the elaboration of these alarm in cytokines or even other, you know, factors. Um, you know, your you can keratinocytes make nerve growth factor. They make lots of things that can probably affect your nerves for that itch factor, even if you don't get a lot of the inflammatory cascade. Um, but you probably but we also know about that, you know, kind of TH2 decline or you know, immunosenescence concept. And so you know, we think of immunosenescence as really just being limited to maybe how the immune cells are dysfunctioning and elaborating more type 2 cytokines. But the truth is, you know, why why wouldn't every other cell be doing, you know, we're, we're, it's all aging. There, there's a metabolic load on every cell. So fibroblasts are probably no different. And as I mentioned, you know, we talk about periostin because that's something we've defined. We know there's a receptor on the nerve. We know that it can cause itching. Um, periostin is also going to be involved in other aspects of even just vascular fragility and activity. And, and, and um, you know, there are probably many aspects of collagen remodeling in response to fibroblast activity that play a role in, um, in some of the signs we see with aging, those we know about, but also this evolution of kind of itch and inflammation, you know, in in the skin. And I think one of the things that happens as we age is that because your nerves actually themselves also uh, kind of start to regulate these various receptors, they can become sensitized. Uh, they they might respond to low levels of these factors, right? That are being that are that are being elaborated just due to the normal insults you know, uh, like day-to-day -day insults, wear and tear, but also just to the aging process. And as our nerves become sensitized, we feel more, you know, more itchy. Now, I am not a fibroblast expert by any means, but it does, well, but, you know, there are a couple of things we do know. We know that actually periostin levels are higher in the skin in itchy patients and in parigonodularis. We know that they're actually even elevated out in, in the non-lesional skin. Right, and we know that type two cytokines are elevated in non um, in non lesional skin and PN. So, what is it, right, about maybe not to the extent that it's elevated in lesional skin, but but it's there, right, and it's circulating. That's why some people make the argument this is actually more of a systemic disease as opposed to just a localized skin disease. But there are something about the fibroblasts in those area where they are being hyperproductive and prolific in their production of periostin. And like I say, my, my group term for these things, you know, whether I'm talking about fibroblasts or mast cells or whatever, is the 300 other things we don't, we haven't looked at yet um, that are probably playing a role there. Um, you know, Sean Quatra is actually doing a lot of work in this in this area. I know Gil Yasipovich also, you know, needs no <laughs> clarification around who he is, but you know, my my itchy file, my itch family, as some people say, um, and, and they're looking into this. You know, when you think about fibroblasts, even diseases like scleroderma, right? Those fibroblasts are probably producing things that, you know, in addition to periostin that are leading to the fibrosis that you see, but are also probably contributing to the fact that those patients feel a lot of itch and like burning and funny sensations can be triggering kind of neural dysregulation as well. So I wish I had a more detailed answer to your question, but I think the fibroblast is actually one of the key factors um, in 
what makes PN distinct and also more severe in certain subtypes. And, and you know, you bring up IL-31. So we know that they, they're, they're actually responsive to IL-31, right? We know that levels of fibroblast activity actually come down when there's IL-31 blockade. So there are also people who are, who are really working on that. There's, there's no doubt that it will play. We need to know more about that regulation, but that these type 2 cytokines and certainly IL-31 is... Um, is they, it has kind of autocrine and paracrine effects, if you will, on the fibroblast, and is um, and is also being you know contributing to the pool you know of that vicious cycle. So it's really it's fascinating to me. Yeah. No, thank you so much for that. No, it's it's so fascinating. It's just it, I think we can do like a whole. Actually, if you can come back and do it a whole hour on the fibroblast. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, that would be. It, 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 it's interesting. You know, a long time ago, uh, 10 years ago, I thought about studying um, the fibroblast contribution to itch in, in scleroderma. That was one of the things I, in morphia and scleroderma. And um, I, I, you know, I ended up actually working on something else instead. But it's it's been something that I have been interested. I'd be I'd be happy to talk about it, actually. Because <laughs> <It's laughs> so I think it's, you know, when we think about it with like the aging, the fibroblast, if they look at, at the actual fibroblast, the cell, they look all, you know, sad and immunosenescent and they've lost their attachments and they're just spewing out all this bad stuff and cytokines. Like, I'm curious, like when, if you biopsy and, and you might notice that the pregonodulares areas are the fibroblasts healthy are they connected or are they kind of looking like what fibroblasts look like in super aged skin where they're just kind of not functional and they're more the basically like the immunosuppressant you know, kind of cell that's just disorganized and creating all sorts of badness around it you know so i don't i don't actually know about the histologic and the kind of cytoarchitecture of the fibroblasts itself if it looks disordered i'll actually look into that and i can get back to you personally um, or kind of individually about that. I I wouldn't be surprised if there is kind of macro structure, like just, you know, the, like architectural changes, but I don't beyond just the the kind of the way the, the perigo nodule looks, but it's an interesting question. I don't know if anyone's even looked ultra structurally either. Uh, so that's something that I can look into. And if people aren't, maybe they should. Just, yeah, it's just fascinating. But I won't I won't go too much further than the fibroblast, but I just think it's such an interest. Anyway, it's one of those things like the TH1, TH2, and then we have TH17. And I feel like this is going to be the next wait, we're going to be hearing a lot more probably on the fibroblasts. I, I think so. I definitely th- think so. And I think actually as we learn more about that, we're also going to learn more about, you know, other diseases where we don't think fibroblasts play a role, but now it turns out that they do. They um, have- yeah. And there's definitely that. I mean, with like aging, we definitely think of the UV exposure. But I mean, I can, I can kind of think of a world where maybe some of the pregonodulars areas could be somewhat, you know, maybe the UV is an indicator. Maybe there are some from fibroblast dysfunction happening and all of that. I mean, we sometimes see it on the extensors. I, I, we think of most of they could just reach it probably better and scratch those areas. But maybe there are some components to that. Yeah, because but when you ask again, if you ask patients if they're itchy in the middle of their back where they can't reach it's it, they, there too. they are right. And then there are other areas where they can scratch that where they're less likely to most of the time. Like even their face, like you know, you know, you may see somebody with like one parigo nodule on their cheek, but you you don't usually see people with this prominent, um, you know, this prominent uh, facial PN, and so. I think that does speak to these different like neighborhoods or loci of where there's there is more acquired. Um, I wouldn't say acquired; it could be innate, like dysfunction. And and who knows if those the niche of the the fibroblast is different in those areas. No, nope, fantastic. Oh, there's another question from Martha. Do you ever combine dupilumab with methotrexate or cyclosporin? Um, all the time. <laughs> uh, so I I will frequently use. I mean, my my most common is dupilumab and methotrexate. I've had some patients where I had them on cyclosporin and I was transitioning them to dupilumab for both AD, for PN, for other disorders, um, you know, and I will occasionally keep people on a much lower dose of the cyclosporin while, not just while they're transitioning, even after they're on the dupilumab if we need that for some time. Uh, but typically, just because of its side effect profile, I get people off of cyclosporin if I can, certainly if the dupilumab is holding them. But then methotrexate, I have very, very little um, concern for the average patient of keeping them on a low-dose methotrexate, whether it's 7.5 to anywhere to 17.5. Um, 
it's atypical for me to have high dose methotrexate and dupilumab uh, together, but but the combo very frequently. And that's the one other thing I, I should have said, I think more explicitly, is that when we're thinking about, you know, when we're thinking about treatment ladders, I I actually frequently have patients, um, I'd say more often than not, I have patients on m- multiple things on that tier, right? Like I have, I almost always have somebody in t- the tier two neuro, um, whether it's gabapentin, pregamalin, amitriptyline, doxepin, you know, even depending on their other diseases, I might have multiple of those. And then something from the the right side of that column, whether it be dupilumab and methotrexate. I think, you know, one thing with these newer agents, right, that are coming down the line, you know, I mentioned the fact that they're targeting nerves. You know, we knew they were targeting immune cells, right? We didn't know that they were tar- they were probably targeting fibroblasts and they're also targeting nerves. And now we know that. And so I think one of the reasons some of these drugs have been so effective quite frankly, is that they're targeting what we should have always been targeting. And we were not doing as well with the individual isolated drugs um, that we now are able to do with these drugs for we didn't, you know, we we almost couldn't have assumed their mechanism of action because we didn't know it at first. And so I think that that is uh, one of the things that makes these drugs so, so helpful is that they actually are hitting multiple cell types. Thank you so much. This has been such a fantastic talk. And I think we're all going to just like learn so much after this. And it's really changing just how we, I think our, like next week, probably we'll probably see some patients in clinic and just think a little bit differently. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I mean, I am a, I'm a firm believer. You kind of got to think about these things for all patients because it's that same idea, you know, half patients will respond beautifully for reasons you may or may not understand, but there's going to be some who doesn't. And the more you learn from those who do, the more you realize about those, you know, how you might help those who don't. But thank you so much for having me. And a huge thank you to Dr. Serena Elmira for joining our SF Derm conference and the wonderful talk. And thank you everyone for joining us again on the Future of Dermatology podcast. <music>